So this is uh, from quiz number two, number three, um, and you were asked to rank these substituents. Uh, so again, this is just that uh, atomic number ranking. So if you look here, the first, so this squiggly lines meant, okay, if, if that's what it's attached to. So if you go out, carbon, you go out, carbon, you go out, carbon, go out, carbon. So everybody's a carbon at first, so it's all tied. And then from here, you go, you see, okay, so what is this first carbon bonded to? So in this case, it's bonded to a carbon and two hydrogens, and this atom right here. What's this carbon bonded to? It's bonded to a carbon, a carbon, and a hydrogen. This one, carbon, carbon, carbon. And then here, a carbon and two hydrogens. So the highest atomic number always wins. It's not about overall, anything like that. But in this case, uh, you can look, okay, you can say carbon, carbon, carbon. So everybody's tied still. Then you see hydrogen, carbon, carbon, hydrogen. So these two fall out. Now these two are still tied. Then we go to the third, third element, hydrogen and carbon. So this is the highest ranking one. So we'd rank this one one and this one two. Now between these two, carbon, carbon, hydrogen, 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 tied still. So we gotta go out another carbon. Now we gotta look at, so we've essentially already done this one, now we gotta look at this one. We've done this one, now we gotta look at this one. So what's this carbon bond to? It's bonded to a carbon, a carbon, and a carbon. So this is all done. Carbon, carbon, carbon. What's this one bonded to? So these are all done. Carbon, carbon, hydrogen. So tie, 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 winner. And by winner, I mean third. And then fourth, obviously. All right? Gotta know how to rank those things. It's all about the atomic number. The high one wins. It's not a total thing, it's about the high number wins. And then the next thing it asks, it says, using these substituents, draw an asymmetric center with all four as an R stereoisomer. So that means you need to take these and turn them into an R stereoisomer. So I'm gonna put this stuff kind of here. All right, so way to do that, draw wedge and hatches. All right, you'd grab your model kit, right? The R stereoisomer. Right? And the easiest way to do this, I would put the fourth rank thing going away from you. So that would be this. Uh, I want to do R. So R rotates clockwise. So I want the top one here. And then number two could be here. And number three, there. So that would be one version of R. You could draw you could draw this other ways, but I'm pretty sure this is R. All right, there's lots of ways you could draw it, but you gotta make sure you use the right stereoisomer. So for this one I have, if I show my rankings, it's uh, let's see. So this is one, this one was four, two, three. That's just one way you could do it. It doesn't have to be that way. If you look back at your at your PowerPoints, there's like actually there's one slide that shows the way to draw S two S butanol or something twelve different ways. But it's all just, it's all the same S, but it's just drawn different ways. Right, the wedges and hatches, it's just all 3D arrangement, so it can be indicated multiple ways. So this is number number six from quiz two, 2017. Like again, they'll emphasize, right? New new semester, new quiz, new world. Good to look at for ideas, but by all means, every every year is unique. Um, so for this one, it asks you rank the reactivity of the electrophiles in an SN2 reaction. And so an SN2 reaction, what, what kind of electrophiles work the best? The primary ones, right? So we were, we're really looking for less sterics. And that's because the nucleophile needs to get to sigma star, right? Which is 180 degrees from the leaving group, right, that backside attack. So we don't want a 
bunch of bonds on the carbon that's bonded to the leaving group. And the type of bonds matter. So hydrogens are obviously smaller than carbon. So this, sometimes it helps to draw in the hydrogens on the leaving group. So this is not a primary. This is actually a methyl, methyl iodide. So that's the least sterically hindered. So this would be the fastest. So that'd be one. This is a primary carbon, right? The leaving group is attached to a primary carbon, a carbon bond to two hydrogens. This is a tertiary, so this is primary. This is a tertiary carbon that's bonded to the leaving group. And this is a secondary carbon that's bonded to the leaving group, right, with one hydrogen there. So the less sterically encumbered, the faster it will be for an SN2 reaction. So the fastest would be a methyl, then it would be the primary, so if I did a different color. One fastest, two, three, four. Right? It's all about the sterics. Looking for less sterics for react, make it faster. Uh, number three, number three in homework number four, um, asking what's a chiral and achiral compound. So molecules are chiral or achiral. Chiral molecules have asymmetric centers. Asymmetric centers are sp3 hybridized bond to four different things. But just because you have asymmetric centers doesn't mean you're always chiral. And the one exception is the meso compounds. That's not in play here. So here, one of the examples is a nitrogen, right? And that's why I always said sp3 hybridized. What's the hybridization state of this nitrogen? It's sp3. It only has sigma bonds. Does it have four different things bonded to it? No. no. So this is achiral. It's achiral. It does not have a chiral center, an asymmetric center. Now this other one, so what made this problem hard is actually they gave you the formulas like H, N, C, L, but they didn't actually draw the Lewis dot structure. That's what made it harder. So for this one, let's number these carbons. One, two, three, four. Okay? So there's four carbons. So let's just draw the four carbons out. One, two, three, four. Carbon one has three hydrogens on it. Good. Carbon two has one hydrogen, and it looks like an OH. Three has two H's, and four has three H's. Got to be able to look at this and draw this. Now, if you look at this, maybe it looks a little, a little easier. Is there an asymmetric center in this one? Carbon one, SP3, everything's SP3 hydride, so that's good. Are any of these atoms bond to four different things? Carbon two is bonded to an H, an OH, a methyl, and an ethyl. So this is an this molecule is chiral because it has an asymmetric center. Yeah. So the trick was really drawing these things out, numbering your carbons. And what does it have to do with the mirror image? Nothing at this point. That means it can have enantiomers because it has an asymmetric center. It means it could be R and S, which means it can have enantiomers, a pair of enantiomers. So number five on the quiz from quiz two from 2017. So you gotta think a little bit here. So it says label the molecules below as either E or Z or RS. So you can't be both, right? E or Z refers to geometric isomers that are pi bonds, that are alkenes, right? So for instance, you can't label this E or Z. There's no alkene. So you shouldn't, like, so that, so just ignore, don't get confused by that. This could be, this could be R and S because it's an asymmetric center, but it can't be E or Z. In the same way, this doesn't have any asymmetric centers, but it does have the ability to become e or, be E or Z. All right? So now let's go through and how we do these. So for the alkenes, we split them down the middle, and we focus on each carbon of the, of the alkene and we rank the two things attached to that carbon. So there's no one through four. You don't do one through four here either. You've never seen me do that. You've never seen me do that. So you go fluorine versus chlorine. Who has a higher atomic number? Chlorine. Chlorine does. So you put a little star next to chlorine. Now you go to the next carbon here. Carbon versus oxygen. Who has a higher, who has a higher atomic number? Oxygen. So you put a little star next to oxygen. And then you stop and say, okay, are the two star things on the same side or are they on the opposite side? Right now, they're on the same side of the pi bond. So this would be 
Z. Z same, Z same side. So could it, this doesn't have, you don't have to have, you can have an alkene that's not E or Z. If these groups on the carbon are the same, mm -hmm. then you can't rank them. Yeah. So then that, that amp, that's just an alkene. That's, it can't be E or Z. So that's why you still do the rankings. Right? And the two things that have highest priority on the same side, it's Z. If they're on opposite sides, it's E. Now for this one, it has nothing to do with E or Z. It's just R and S again. So you've got to rank them. So what's the highest ranked thing? Bromine, so that would be one. What's the lowest ranked? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Ethyl versus methyl. Carbon, carbon. This is two. This is three. Got to figure out what it is. R, S. I don't know which one is it. It is... Do, 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 do. I have S. Is that right? Yeah. Use your models. Bring your models and use your models. This is a problem from homework number four. Around 32. Uh, about what are these compounds to each other? Like it's kind of asking these kind of questions. What are they to each other? Um, so if you look at this, so these are a pair of things, so they could be a couple different things. They could either be identical, enantiomers, or diastereomers. So let's just think about the definitions of these things, right? So to be an enantiomer, you actually have to have asymmetric centers, first of all. That's one. And then to be a diastereomer, you have to have at least two asymmetric centers. So that would, these fit that category. So they could be identical, they could be enantiomers, they could be diastereomers. But in this case, what you look at... You could figure out, right, is this center RS and is this center RS? You could go through and do that. Totally fine. And you could do the same thing here, right? And that'd be the most absolute positive way to know what they are to each other. But we also could just look at this and say, okay, this, ace, this center is the same as that center. So they're identical. Oh, that makes me think, well, maybe enantiomers. Let's look at the next center. This center, the methyl is up, and this center, the methyl is pointed down. Uh-oh. That looks like it's the opposite. So one's the same, and at least one's different. That means these compounds are diastereomers. Now, you could have taken the time to figure out this is RS. This is R. S, R, S, R, S. So this is R, S, R, R. Must be that way. Right? So I think this is R, S, if that's right. Hope so. R, S, and this one's R, R. So you can look at, if you, knew, if you saw that, then it's easy to see. Right? Oh, one's the same as one's different. That's a di those are diastereomers to each other. Right? Well, the, the other way to ask this would be, and that's the next question down in this question actually is, they have everything opposite. So if everything's opposite, then they're enantiomers. Right? If everything's opposite, then they're enantiomers to each other. We'll go to the mechanism too. So for this one, this is something from sapling 18 um, from homework number five. So the question here is predict the type of substitution mechanism and predict predict which reaction of the pair will occur at a faster rate and draw the correct organic product. So, we have here, the first question you should ask yourself when you're evaluating these things is what type of electrophile, what type of alkylate do you have? Primary, secondary, tertiary, benzylic, allylic, lone pairs, blah, blah, blah. What kind do we have here? Tertiary. tertiary. That immediately rules out something. So we have a tertiary, we have a tertiary alkylate. That rules it out? It, no, it's S no, it's it can be SN2. So just be careful, right? We're going to learn more reactions. We know it can't be SN2. So as far as substitution reaction goes, now we're set. It is SN1. So it's SN1. So what do we know about SN1? We know, right, the mechanism. The first step is the rate determining step, that loss of leading group. And we know that the rate is equal to what? Rate constant times concentration of the electrophile, right? Because that first step is the slow step. They're forming the carbocation, the loss of leaving, leaving group. What that means then, so if you look here, so I've kept this concentration the same, and I've in situation B, I've added more alcohol, what ends up being the nucleophile, the thing we actually substitute. But does that matter? Will this, adding more of this increase the rate? 
No, because it's not part of the rate determining step. It's just the it's just this is the nucleophile, but the nucleophile is not part of the rate determining step. It's only the electrophile that matters. So when the leaving group leaves, does that mean CL? It just does its own thing. Yep. So when the leaving group leaves, that means CL saying, "See ya." <laughs> All right. Boom. Gone. So these this is SN1. This is SN1. This, we're literally doing an SN1 right now. We've made a carbocation. Tertiary carbocation is nice and stabilized. The next step, the nucleophile reacts. A lot of times that's the solvent. In this case, whatever is left in there. That's what that's going to be. Plus, the Cl minus is still around. Balance our charge. So we did what steps? Loss of leaving group, nucleophilic attack. Now we're going to need to do a deprotonation. And that gets us to our final product, which is the substitution product, this plus HCl. But the reaction, this came, they only asked for the organic product. Not the inorganic product. So this is the only organic product, tert butanol. So in this case, neither of these they're both SN1, and they're the same rate. Neither one's faster than the other. All right, neither one's faster than the other. Because the thing that you changed isn't part of the rate determining step. Oh gosh, I made a mistake that people often make, and I just did it for you. My fault. Yikes. But one of the things people often do is they lose these carbons. They get so worried about the nucleophile reacting and they forget, which I just did, right? What happened to this carbon? It's still there, my God. So make sure you don't lose carbons like I just did on purpose. All right, so looking at this one, it says, add curved arrows to the reactant side of the following SN2 reaction to indicate the flow of electrons. Draw the product species to show the balance equation using non-binding electrons and formal charges. So even if you didn't know it, they're telling you this is SN2, but you should be able to figure out it's SN2 anyways. So the first question you ask yourself, what kind of alkyl halide do I have? What kind of electrophile do I have here? That's a primary. So can it be SN1? Absolutely not. So it has to be SN2. The other way I know is SN2 is what kind of nucleophile is this? Is it reactive or under, is it charged? Yeah, yeah so that's pretty reactive. That, that makes probably makes you think not SN1, probably SN2. It's also not huge, so good. And they're telling us anyways, so. So what we need to do is the nucleophile, the oxygen is a nucleophile, it attacks the electrophilic carbon, the antibonding orbital, which breaks the bonding between the carbon and the bromine, right? Notice it's the backside attack, that's where sigma star is at. So the product here, you don't have to draw inversion because it's not an asymmetric center, right? There's no RS, so you just gotta draw it like this. Be careful not to lose these two carbons. People always lose these two carbons, I've heard. Mm -hmm. And they also want, make sure you draw the lone pairs in as well. Balance your charge. The other species is the Br minus, which is the leaving group, Right, and this equilibrium is going to lie this way because Br minus is more stable than an O minus because it's more, it's larger, so it can spread that charge out more. So let's pretend that this one, if this had been an asymmetric center, so kind of looking at, explain why in a SN2 reaction the asymmetric center is inverted, right? So an SN2 reaction, because of where sigma star is. Right, because it's 180 degrees away. Whenever a nucleophile attacks, it has to attack from this back side. So if this is an asymmetric center, right, the new nucleophiles on the ends up being on the opposite side of the leaving where the leaving group was, which causes inversion. So what was R becomes S, and what becomes S becomes R. So if it goes into the antibonding. Yes, the electrons go in the antibonding orbital, and that becomes a new bond. Right? How many electrons in a bond? Two. two. Look at two lone pairs, an empty orbital, new bond. Two electrons go, they end up there. What's the situation? 
So for this one, I say this is more reactive. So you know the answer. And the question is why? So you look at the periodic table, nitrogen and phosphorus. Mm -hmm. Phosphorus is larger. But this is more or let's show negative. So it depends on which argument you want to use. So I'm telling you this is more reactive. So we gotta pick one of these arguments. Which is the one that explains this fact? That would be the size. I could have said phosphorus is more I could have said phosphorus is more reactive. Then you have to say, well, that's because of you know, phosphorus that's because oxygen is more electronegative, so it's holding the or Yeah. The electrons are farther away from the nucleus set, right? You, it, it doesn't matter what the answer is. It's how you explain it, right? If I tell you, if I tell you the smaller one's more reactive, right, then it's about size. If I tell you the bigger one's more reactive, it's about electronegativity. It's what periodic trend you want to use to explain this fact. So 